We've been talking about what happens to your optimal consumption bundle as your economic circumstances change, where your economic circumstances are defined by your income and the prices that you face. And we've seen that if you experience an increase in income, the change in the optimal consumption bundle is determined solely by the income effect. Now we turn to price changes, and we'll find that the change in your optimal consumption bundle will be determined by both an income and a substitution effect. So let's think about a consumer whose original optimal consumption bundle lies here. Suppose it's me, and suppose that X1 is gasoline, and suppose that X2 is some composite good of all other goods. This is my original consumption bundle at the original prices that I face. Now suppose that the price of gasoline, the price of good one, increases. Well, we know what that's going to do to the budget constraint. If I consume no gasoline, I'll still be able to consume just as much in other goods as I was able to consume before. But if I consume only gasoline, I won't be able to consume as much as I did before. So we're going to get a new budget constraint that's steeper. Eventually, we're going to have to end up on that budget constraint. So we're going to end up at a new optimal bundle that lies on this new budget constraint, a new tangency. And we know how to calculate that tangency the same way we calculated this one, except we'd use a new price. But we don't see in this picture either an income effect or a substitution effect. For an income effect, we need to see two parallel budget lines because a change in income is a parallel shift in budgets. There's no parallel shift here. To see a substitution effect, we would need to see two budgets with different slopes, different opportunity costs, that are tangent to the same indifference curve. We don't see that here either. So we need to dissect the change in your behavior into both a substitution and an income effect. So suppose that you find me at this gas station and you see that I'm all disturbed by the higher price of gasoline and the fact that I'm not going to be able to reach the same indifference curve as I was able to reach originally. So originally I faced this shallower budget and I ended up consuming at this bundle, let's call that A. So this A is the same as this one. You can't change the price back to what it was. You can't tell the gas station owner to just lower his price again. But what you can do is you can give me cash to compensate me for the fact that I'm now facing a higher price. And so maybe what you'd like to do is give me enough cash to make me just as happy as I was originally. In that case, you would take the final budget constraint and just shift it out parallel because you're just giving me cash. How much cash would you have to give me? Well, you'd have to give me an amount of cash that makes it possible for me to reach this indifference curve again. So an amount that gets me back to this indifference curve. You don't have to make it possible for me to afford the original bundle because I'm willing to substitute between the two goods. You just have to get me to this indifference curve to make me just as happy as I was originally. This new budget that emerges when you give me this cash is called the compensated budget. And since an increase in the price of gasoline makes me worse off, that compensation has to be positive. You have to actually give me cash to get me back to that indifference curve. If instead we had started with a decrease in the price of gasoline, that would have made me happier. So to make me just as happy as I was originally, that compensation would actually have to be negative. You'd have to take money away from me to give me, to get me back to my original indifference curve. So let's call this point B. Now notice that what we're looking at here is exactly the Cayman Island picture. The picture where we have two budget constraints with different slopes tangent to the same indifference curve. So what we're looking at here is a pure substitution effect.
the substitution effect says solely because of the change in opportunity costs. I'm going to change my behavior from originally consuming at bundle A to now consuming at bundle B. I'm going to decrease my consumption of the good that's become more expensive and increase my consumption of the good that's become relatively cheaper. The substitution effect always says that. It always moves us in the same direction, away from what's become more expensive and towards what's become cheaper. So here we now have a pure substitution effect. But of course in the real world you're not there to give me cash. In the real world I have to end up on that final budget constraint. So when you're giving me the cash, I end up at point B. So I end up at a budget that's that blue budget that's tangent to my original indifference curve. at point B. That's the same point as this point here. Point A in this picture would lie somewhere over here. So in the real world, you're not really giving me this cash. So I have to take the cash away again to end up on this magenta budget constraint. But that's a pure parallel shift. I'm just taking cash away from you or you're taking cash away from me. So the magenta budget constraint is going to be parallel to this one. And now we have a pure change in income. We can now ask, well, do we know anything about the goods X1 and X2? That'll help us determine where we're going to end up on that lower parallel budget constraint. Suppose, for example, we knew that my tastes for gasoline were quasi-linear in gasoline. In that case, we know that a change in income doesn't change how much gasoline I consume. So I would start at point B, and I would know that I'm going to end up on this point of my final budget. I wouldn't change my consumption of X1 when you just change, in, change my income, when you just take cash away from me. Or if we knew that your tastes were homothetic, my tastes were homothetic, it would mean that as we take money away from you, you remain on the same ray from the origin. So we draw a ray from the origin through bundle B. And that would give us where we end up on the final budget constraint. If all we knew that is that gasoline was a normal good, then we would know that as income is taken away from me, I consume less gasoline, so I'd end up somewhere over here. And if we knew that gasoline was an inferior good for me, we would know that as we take income away from me, I would consume more gasoline, so I'd end up somewhere over here. So by knowing something about what the indifference map looks like, we can determine what the income effect is going to be. So what we see then is an income effect as we take the cash that we hypothetically gave to you, or to me, away from me again. So now we can put all this in one picture. So what did we do? We started with our original budget constraint. And on that budget constraint, there was an original optimal bundle. We call that bundle A. Then there was an increase in the price of good one, and the price of gasoline. My budget constraint now rotates inward and becomes steeper. I know I'm going to have to end up on that budget constraint, but to dissect my change in behavior into an income and substitution effect, I'll start with the substitution effect and imagine that someone is giving me enough cash to make me just as happy as I was originally, enough cash to get me to this indifference curve, to a point B. That's a pure substitution effect. It's a pure Cayman Island picture, this picture that's hiding inside the more complicated picture. So the substitution effect will be the movement from A to B. Now I have a two parallel budgets. So now I can talk about an income effect. Now I can talk about 
Is x1 normal? Is it inferior? Is it quasi-linear? Am I taste homothetic? So those kinds of things are now coming into play because we see our two parallel budgets. And now I can determine, based on what I know about the goods, where on that final budget constraint I'm going to end up. If you know that x1 is quasi-linear, you can determine exactly where you're going to end up. You're going to end up right underneath point B. If my tastes are homothetic, you can tell exactly where I'm going to end up. You're just going to draw the ray through the origin that goes through point B, and you're going to end up here. If we just know that x1 is normal, we'll be able to come up with a range where we might end up as income falls, I'm going to consume less of x1, so I'm going to end up somewhere here. Similarly, if it's inferior, I'm going to end up somewhere over here. 